All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started. If people are coming in a little bit afterwards, that's okay too. Um, but just to be mindful of everyone's one hour lunch, we'll get started on time. Um, my name is Veronica Noss, and I am the Communication Coordinator for Facilities and Energy. The Energy Conservation Office is happy to host today's Lunch and Learn. We've just got a few housekeeping items that we need to get through before we begin. Today's Lunch and Learn is being live webcast, and we thank IT for helping us make this an option for staff. And in order for us to get through the content and remain on time as much as possible, we ask that questions be held until the end of the presentation, at which point we'll have an open discussion. If you are seated at a council chair, and I see that you all are, that's awesome, thank you. We ask that you use your microphone uh, when it comes to speaking to the group. If you simply press the middle of the button to activate the microphone, and then press it again to deactivate it. And we don't have anyone seated on the outliers just yet, so I can skip over that part. Um, we've set up a short online uh, comment form where we'd like to gather opinions regarding today's session and any ideas you might have for future sessions. The form is already linked to the portal and to the energy management site. Uh, so if you could take time to complete the form when you return to your work area, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also today, we do have hard copies available, and we also have a uh, REAP questionnaire that's going around too. So if you'd like to fill it out old school, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you're pressed for time, you're also welcome to take that back to your station and send it to us inter office, and we'll make sure that REAP gets a copy and we'll keep our copy as well. We've also, we're going to be getting some prizes as well, so they are en route, um, not, not to dismay, um, but we do have ballots and uh, Chelsea's handing those out, so make sure you leave us with your name and your email address. If you do have to leave early, that's okay. Uh, we will track you down and make sure that you get your prize. <laughs> so thanks very much for that, to REAP for donating those prizes. If you have any additional questions uh, regarding today's presentation or any of our regional energy projects, if you could send those to Tom Pedler, he is our our project, our sorry, program manager for corporate energy. Um, he'll take care of that for follow up. And his email address is tpedlar at regionofwaterloo.ca. Um, unfortunately, Tom couldn't be here today. However, we have Joan Eng from the Energy Conservation Office, and Joan's here to field any uh, regional energy related questions that you may have. Links to today's webcast, as well as the PowerPoint slides, will be made available on the energy management site by the end of the week. Does everyone have any questions? I know that was a lot that I just kind of like threw out at you. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering if I might be able to take some photographs to document the event so that we can attempt to share on social media and brag about how great the region is. All right. Is anybody, just, is anybody not okay with having their photos? We're all rock stars. Okay. <laughs> take picture at will. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guest speaker, uh, Patrick Gilbride. Patrick is the Information and Media Design Coordinator for REAP Green Solutions, and we're very happy that he could join us today and shed more light on the subject of stormwater solutions from both a residential and corporate perspective. So please join me in welcoming Patrick to the podium. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so I'll just uh, talk about this is, uh, this is our agenda for today. Um, we're talking at a pretty high level, and I'll just give you a little bit of background on um, REAP and the RAIN program, uh, the Stormwater Credit and Solution Program. Just out of curiosity, how many people uh, here live in Kitchener or Waterloo, the cities? Okay, a fair number. And outside of that? Um, so there is a certain amount of information that is specifically tailored to the stormwater credit program, um, which is right now it's only in Kitchener and Waterloo. Uh, a lot of this information is pretty high level though, so it should be able to apply. Um, and it is a model that's becoming more and more popular. For example, Mississauga is in the process of implementing it and uh, some other Canadian mis municipalities as well. Uh, not on here, as uh, Veronica mentioned, there is, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, I'll make sure of that. Um, and we'll talk about uh, stormwater solutions kind of in your home environment. And for the people who are uh, a little more technical or from engineering departments, we'll touch very sort of briefly on uh, looking at it uh, you know, at a facilities level uh, and at work. Um, so we have more in-depth presentations that will go into more detail of that if you're interested. Just 
uh, get in touch with us. So uh, REAP, uh, REAP Green Solutions, we've, uh, it's a social enterprise. We've been around since 1999. Uh, we were founded by a partnership with the uh, University of Waterloo and the Elora Environment Center for Excellence. Um, it was really started out as uh, a, a, a grassroots movement to try and do something when Canada first signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so our core sort of business from about 1999 onwards was doing energy home audits, uh, which we still do. Um, and uh, obviously uh, those uh, peaked in the era of federal and provincial incentives for, for, for undertaking home energy audits. Uh, we're optimistic that that is actually going to peak again. Uh, there's some signs uh, very early signs that, that there might be um, um, impetus from, from, from government to, to actually, you know, help meet our climate change objectives with, with home energy audits. And we have a new program called the Home Energy Coach. I'll just plug that really quickly, which takes a home energy audit and also uh, guides homeowners. We have uh, somebody who will basically assist them with any sort of retrofits or renovations that they want to do. Uh, so that's that's one of our new programs that we're really excited about. Um, as I said, that was sort of our core operating business. We branched into sort of water sustainability. Uh, actually, one of the things we're doing uh, just this past year is we're working with the region on the wet challenge. I'm not sure if you might have heard that or seen it on buses. Uh, so that's that's sort of a pilot program to do home water audits, um, and then what I want to what I'm here to talk about is the rain program, uh, which started up in 2008, um, and it really started to uh, ramp up in 2012, and uh, we'll go into why. So uh, the rain program, as I mentioned, is uh, it's a program run by REAP is created by Green Communities Canada. So Green Communities Canada is sort of an umbrella organization that works with uh, local not-for-profits like REAP. We're sort of the Waterloo Region uh, not-for-profit and we delivered their Interguide Home Audits as well as uh, the RAIN program and other, other programs as well, which I won't go into. Um, starting in 2012, we worked uh, with the province of Ontario. We got a grant from the province to to, um, and partnered with the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo to talk about, uh, to, to roll out their stormwater utility fee and credit program. Um, so that started in 2012 and really ramped up. So we started doing outreach and we were, REAP was sort of brought on as sort of the communications and outreach piece of that. Um, and to educate people about the utility fees. Um, and then uh, most recently, Cambridge has recently joined the partnership as well, just in the past two years. Um, so I just want to set it up. When we first started up, we didn't really have a great sense of kind of the awareness of stormwater issues or stormwater more generally. Um, we actually held in our first year a rain barrel sale. Uh, so I thought it was kind of interesting to bring along a little video camera and kind of ask people, okay, what do you think happens to rain after it kind of falls on your property? So uh, I'll just kind of run it and... Uh
So again, don't be embarrassed if you couldn't answer that. Uh, I'm not sure that I could have uh, prior to starting at REAP three and a half years ago. Uh, but it kind of just gives you kind of a baseline understanding of, okay, um, what happens to stormwater and why this uh, can theoretically be an issue. So why, why is it an issue, um, you know, that rain basically flows directly into our lakes and rivers in many neighborhoods, uh, especially older neighborhoods? Um, so if you look at this sort of um, illustration, you can see that rain falls. Uh, in pre-development era, this would be basically, you know, a field. It would basically fall where it would and soak into the ground or find its way into a stream and sort of meander its way into the Grand River or different waterways uh, down to Lake Erie. Um, in this kind of urbanized scenario, um, it falls on hard surfaces um, and rushes off the property. Um, what it also does is kind of pick up any sort of pollution along with it, so driveways, gasolines, grit, anything like that. Uh, you'll also notice that um, lawns are sort of uh, illustrated on this, uh, pointed out. Um, I've heard some some people refer to it as green cement at the times because it's like, especially in those warm summer months where you get lots of weeks of dry periods, uh, you know, those lawns harden up and, you know, that's also when you get sort of those intense storm events and uh, that's when it will rush off. If there's any sort of uh, contaminants like pet waste is the big one uh, that will sort of uh, come down and go into the storm sewer um, as well as anything from the street obviously as well so it can be a sort of a big water quality issue um, and that is sort of um, as many of you will know that is the grand is uh, you know a source of about 10 to 15 percent of our drinking water as well so it affects not just wildlife but us as well <clears throat> um, the other sort of side effect of that is you especially when you have these big storm events is that you know that water rushes into the storm sewer system um, and it has to go somewhere um, and increasingly since we have larger larger cities and larger development, uh, the infrastructure isn't able to handle these large volumes of water. Uh, so this is, was the scene kind of in the south end of Kitchener in uh, June 2013. Um, there was pictures, as you can see at the bottom, there's different thumbnails there where Fairview Mall was basically a swimming pool. Um, and I mean, and compared to uh, other events that year in Calgary, and Toronto, this was reasonably small scale as well. So um, it's becoming a big issue in terms of property damage. Um, in fact, in the past, um, just in the past little bit, flood, flood damage has surpassed fire damage in terms of claims for insurance companies. So they're, they're really motivated to try and find solutions to this as well. Um, <clears throat> So uh, how do we look at this? So on the left, you see sort of conventional stormwater management, um, what we would term gray infrastructure. Um, one way to sort of deal with stormwater management and, and, and deal with some of these issues and reduce problems downstream is to manage rain where it falls and, and basically want to go from gray to green. And on the right, you see it's basically a bioswale, which is taking some of that parking lot water, uh, actually helping to clean it as well, uh, so that it's not only um, you know managing flooding issues, water quantity, volume issues, but also water quality issues as well. Um, so, um, just to give you a little bit of history and background on the stormwater credit program and don't let this slide scare you. I'm not about to go into a bunch of statistics or anything like that. Um, this is actually just to show you that water utility rates are on the rise and the trend is that's that top bar, the, the blue bar at the top. So that includes uh, water, water rates, sewage rates, and stormwater. That's all sort of combined into one. Um, this is, I stole this from like um, 
from some U.S. data. If anybody has local, a slide like this uh, that applies to the region, I'd be very happy to, uh, to hear from you. But it, it maps pretty well uh, in terms, especially the water utility rate is, I mean, the message from this is that it's going up. Um, the other sort of takeaway from that is the reason it's going up is because there's an infrastructure deficit on, on that side. Um, which is one of the reasons that uh, Kitchener and Waterloo decided to bring in a specific uh, utility field, uh, fee to sort of deal with that deficit. Um, traditionally, um, stormwater departments have get, get their funding out of property taxes, uh, which basically means that it's sort of kind of a flat rate. Uh, and uh, they were finding that, uh, again, they were chronically underfunded in the stormwater departments. Uh, I think it was to the tune of $4 million a year uh, using Kitchener numbers. So they are really looking to get a dedicated source of funding so that they could address some of these issues. That was sort of the impetus. Uh, after it got brought in, uh, people said, hey, why should I, why should I pay this? Uh, and so they started to look at ways to make it even more equitable so that they could, uh, if people manage water on their own property before it actually gets into the storm sewer, they can get a credit back. Uh, so that's, that's what you see, uh, kind of what was brought in in 2011 and uh, started to be implemented in 2012. And uh, that's when REAP came on board to help, uh, you know, create awareness, awareness about this program and get people to actually apply. Uh, and they're, there's differences between, uh, which I'll go into, between credits for the residential side versus uh, on the non-residential or the sort of ICI side. Um, but what is possible is you can get up to 45% of your stormwater utility fee back if you take certain measures like managing stormwater on your property. Uh, the bar is a little higher with, uh, again, with uh, uh, the ICI sector, the institutionals, uh, commercial sector. Um, that's how it stands right now. Kitchener, the city of Kitchener and city of Waterloo have all both been involved. They're looking at uh, creating a new stormwater, stormwater master plan. Uh, they're in the process of doing that right now. And in 2016 is the target to sort of look at different ways of, uh, you know, improving the credit program. So uh, there might be changes coming. Uh, we're optimistic that, you know, that we can get above that 45% mark even. Uh, so this is just to give you a general idea. Uh, you may or may not have noticed uh, a lot of people are quite vociferous when they see that there's a separate line item on their water bill that says stormwater, stormwater utility fee. Uh, this kind of gives you a general idea of the rates people are paying. And again, there are subtle differences between Kitchener and, well, they're not so subtle when we get uh, further along. But there are differences between how the stormwater utility is applied in Kitchener and Waterloo. Um, and I'll touch on a little bit of that, um, but um, if you have more questions, we can talk about it at the end or uh, follow up with me afterwards. So again, it's about $165 a year we're looking at, kind of at the top end, uh, if you have a home. And there's a range, and I'll, I'll touch on that, why there's a range shortly. But basically, as you get to larger and larger properties, uh, the fees go up, essentially. So multi-residential apartment buildings, condos, uh, can pay sort of a higher rate. When you get into the business side of things, then the fees start to go up, uh, especially when you get into very large businesses. So again, like Fairview Mall or um, very large properties. Um, so how is it calculated? Um, it's basically uh, when they, before they started up the program, they did sort of a satellite imaging exercise where they looked at all the properties and sort of divided them into sort of small, medium, and large. In addition to that, um, they really looked at how much impervious surface is on that property. 
so what I mean by impervious surfaces, again, those hard surfaces, uh, that includes uh, driveways, parking lots, and the footprint of the building. Uh, so based on that, um, that's going to determine what you're paying on a monthly basis on your utility fee. Uh, and as I said, the more you pave, the more you pay. That's how it's intentional. That's how it's uh, the program is designed to work anyway. Um, so in terms of getting credits back, uh, as I mentioned, if you are a homeowner, a property owner at home, uh, you can get up to 45% back just by uh, diverting water, uh, capturing it, uh, or infiltrating it on your property um, before it enters the storm sewer system. Um, and here's a chart. It's just, uh, you'll see there's different tiers that you can sort of enter into. Uh, 200 to 800 liters, uh, just to give you a sense of that. Uh, a rain barrel, typically, um, the ones that were uh, sort of in the uh, previous historical regional sales were about 200 liters, you know, 200, 220 liters on average. Um, so if you have a rain barrel, that's great. You'll get uh, you'll get something back. You can apply through the municipalities. Um, and then once you get into some of these larger things, you need more and more rain barrels if that's sort of the technology you're going to use. Uh, and then you have to start doing things like having a cistern um, or uh, combining different technologies like cisterns, uh, rain gardens, and uh, infiltration galleries um, to really get to that point where you're going to get all of your credits back. Um, so just to give you a sense of some of the issues, the stormwater problems are at home. We talked about sort of wet basements. That's sort of a big one. Uh, you know, leaky foundations. Uh, this picture in the bottom left is actually a picture of my flat roof. I live uh, very close to Victoria Park. And there's a lot of organic matter. So it can become an issue uh, you know, when you have large storm events and the water overflows or, and it's right next to your foundation. So that can, that can sort of uh, cause problems, obviously. Um, again, we see here on the right, um, somebody who has really good intentions. Uh, they have a rain barrel set up, but um, obviously it's not designed to handle the amount of water that's coming from that rooftop. Uh, so um, even when you do set up a rain barrel, you really have to look at sort of understanding how much water, like this, the amount of surface area on your roof is going to be flowing into it, as well as look at, okay, what's going to happen after that rain barrel fills up? You know, you have to always have to kind of look at the overflow, because if it's going next to your foundation, you're going to experience problems. Um, and then, like I said, as I talked about it, the big driver in all this is sort of uh, the flooding issues that are pervasive with uh, the gray infrastructure I talked about. <coughs> Too much water in the wrong places. So what can we do about it? Um, and if you don't really uh, remember anything else, I would encourage you to kind of remember the things, slow it down, soak it up, keep it clean. Um, that's sort of, if you can remember those things, you can sort of understand the principles behind green infrastructure and, um, you know, what you need, what are ways to manage stormwater so it doesn't become a problem downstream. Uh, on the left, you see, again, this is sort of rainwater harvesting. That's an above ground cistern that was sort of designed in Australia where they're sort of way ahead of us after they're, they had like almost a 10 year drought there. Um, so a lot of these technologies are starting to get implemented um, and um, and applied in sort of cold weather climates as well. So that's that's sort of a, a new thing, but uh, we're finding that they, you know, if you apply certain principles that they work pretty well. In the middle is, uh, is a shot of a rain garden. Um, and again, the keep it clean is, uh, you know, managing pollutants, uh, you know, salt is a big one which I'll touch on later in the presentation as well. 
ideally you want to deal with uh, you know salt alternatives or um, you know just mechanical shoveling there's other things you can do to keep it clean as well but those are sort of the foundational principles uh, again I talked about uh, slow it down I'll just drill down into these uh, areas a little bit more briefly rain barrels are great to have especially if you already have a garden and you need water and uh, the region is certainly encouraging them because it means that you use less municipal water um, uh, from from the taps to, to actually water your gardens um, in terms of stormwater technology they're they're good but it doesn't take long for one to fill up so what you might want to do is if you have rain barrels just about all of them can be sort of connected in series and that's that's sort of on the left you see an example of that um, and that's fairly easy to do um, and uh, not pretty cost-effective a solution as well. Uh, on the right, uh, we see a tree planting. You can sort of make it out. So trees are really awesome in terms of uh, one soaking up water, but also slowing it down. Uh, if you've ever stood under a tree when it's raining, you kind of notice that you'll stay dry. So it kind of it stops that giant rush from coming uh, into the storm sewers. Uh, as well as allows it to evaporate and soak into the soil as well. Um, you can get credits for your trees if you're in City of Waterloo, but not not if you're in City of Kitchener. Uh, but we'd obviously still encourage you to plant them or, or take care of the ones you have. Um, and rain gardens. These are these are things that uh, I get really passionate and excited about. Um, rain gardens. Um, Aesthetically, they kind of look like any other garden, or they can, um, as you can see. Uh, what's really different is uh, they're sometimes called uh, sunken gardens or bowl-shaped gardens. Uh, the difference between a regular garden and a rain garden is basically it's dug out, and I have a bit of a animation to kind of show you. It's dug out, it's excavated, and that allows for uh, water to be captured uh, a large volume of water and you fill it up with uh, mulch, a mixture of mulch, topsoil and sand which is uh, a really porous material so it allows it to go down as well as uh, allows it to retain that water for up to 24 to 48 hours and you don't, if you're going to build a rain garden uh, you want to do sort of a, uh, it's called a perk test, percolation test uh, to, to be able to make sure that your soil is going to infiltrate water into the ground because um, if you if it doesn't drain within 24 to 48 hours you basically have a wetland you don't have a rain garden right uh, um, so um, and again a lot of these technologies uh, like I kind of intimated about uh, we call them sort of new technologies but they've been around for you know hundreds of years it's only something that we've gotten away from in the past you know latter half of the 20th century really um, so permeable paving uh, a lot of people get very excited about permeable paving um, they used to call it something like cobblestone um, but essentially it's similar to a rain garden in so much as uh, the real function of it is kind of what's underneath those pavers so underneath it, uh, you can kind of make out that there's a layer of gravel. Underneath that are larger and larger stones. So it allows water to pass through it and also sort of store it for, for that sort of 24 to 48 hour period and allow it to go back into the ground. Um, and then the other difference, as you can kind of see on the right, is that um, um, they have sort of larger gaps between them and spacer bars in between the pavers which allows that water to once it falls on the surface to go down and into that sort of underneath storage chamber um, and I think I got a good side by side so on the right you can kind of see the permeable pavers uh, on the left are some traditional pavers and you'll notice they're kind of filled in with sand uh, so they're not going to allow a lot of water to pass 
through them. And uh, again, like I said, the base layer is really the critical difference. Uh, and you can kind of see uh, kind of some of the maintenance issues with permeable pavers that you, you might run into is you want to keep those gaps clear of sort of weeds and stuff like that uh, to make sure that they're functioning like they should. Um, and again, I'll use the terminology that the, uh, the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo use. They say infiltration galleries. Again, this is not a new technology, uh, especially if I speak to anybody who lives out in the country. They're pretty familiar with uh, different ways of sort of getting water to soak into the ground and managing water in farmers' fields and stuff like that. Um, there are also, you might have heard the term dry wells or French drains. This is essentially the same technology. Um, and uh, again, uh, what you see on the left, you can kind of make it out. It's, it's basically a glorified milk crate. Um, so instead of filling it with stones, as you would in a traditional sort of French drain application, uh, you can put one of these crates in and they, they actually have more space. They can capture a lot more water uh, be just because there's, there's more void space in them. So you wrap it in landscape fabric, bury it in the ground, and direct your water uh, to it. In this case, he has uh, uh, water coming both from his downspout and overflow from his rain barrel. And you just basically have to channel it uh, there. And again, you would want to do a perk test again to make sure you have the right soils for this. Uh, and also kind of look at uh, you know, overflow if that overflows as well. Um, but, uh, but they're a great way to sort of solve issues if you have ponding in your backyards or, or other issues, uh, you know, and obviously they're, they're well designed to manage stormwater as well. Uh, so this is kind of the keep it clean uh, aspect of things. Uh, again, we kind of touched on some of the issues with, uh, you know, pollution from driveways and car pollutants. Uh, so uh, that sort of gets magnified again if you're doing car washing because you're also using adding phosphates and cleaners which you know washes off your driveway and goes down into the storm sewer system and out to the rivers. Um, pet waste, fertilizer, pesticides. Uh, so I mean as an alternative commercial car washes are required to sort of manage these pollutants so if you do want to wash your car we'd encourage you to use a commercial car wash um, or do like this guy and just not wash it at all. Um, and I'm just going to go into, uh, and like I said, um, this is sort of the industrial commercial uh, business side of things. Uh, and I'll go into this at a pretty high level and provide some examples from some region of Waterloo facilities that we've actually worked with. Um, but uh, again, this is a pretty high level presentation. If you're looking at deeper in depth case studies or, um, or, or, or looking at maintenance uh, issues, then we do have uh, presentations that will go into that in a little more technical detail. <laughs> Uh, the main difference that you want to note is if you are a facility manager or, or managing the stormwater utility uh, rate is unlike with your home, there's a higher bar. So you can get 20, up to 25% of that utility feedback by managing water, um, the volume of water, uh, but there's also a requirement to manage water quality as well. Uh, so reducing pollutants that might be coming from your property as well. And uh, there's also an educational component as well. Uh, so by virtue of, for example, having a uh, REAP rain uh, webinar, you can get 5% back. But also by just providing uh, information to your clients, customers, et cetera, on, on, on stormwater issues. Um, so again, like I said, I won't go into too much detail on any of these stormwater ponds. Uh, these are technologies that really started to be implemented, uh, you know, 
uh, generation ago. Uh, and they're finding that one of the reasons that uh, is the impetus to, to look at green infrastructure is uh, that these technologies are require have sort of high maintenance costs. So again, the advantage of sort of managing water through some of these other technologies um, or uh, can, can, can actually help reduce your costs. Parking lot storage, again, these are, uh, that basically means that parking lots are designed to retain water and slowly release it. Uh, and then rooftop storage, same kind of thing. These are mainly on flat roofs. You'll see them in sort of large industrial buildings. Um, and, then, and again, these are the quote unquote new technologies uh, or the ecological or the green infrastructure ones. Uh, infiltration galleries, rain gardens, rain gardens, rainwater harvesting, permeable paving. Uh, and green roofs. So uh, the first four are basically, you know, it's the same principles as what we talked about in the sort of residential application. Um, it's just sort of larger scale and more robust for the sort of, uh, for, the, for the business sector. Uh, and then green roofs, uh, again, you can get a credit for those um, if you're in the city of Waterloo. Um, that's another sort of one of those small differences. Uh, those, uh, I won't go into too much detail on, but uh, they're cool technology, but it's something you really have to plan for and make sure that your building has uh, the right structural uh, uh, measures in place that it's able to handle a green roof. Um, so, uh, like I said, we have a program called the Rain Business Visit. Uh, where we'll actually go and do an audit on a property. Uh, so these are some pictures. We went out to the GRT Operations Center on Strasburg Road um, and looked at some of the technologies that they had, uh, as well as sort of maintaining their existing technologies. Again, this is uh, looks at rooftop storage. Um, in the inset, in the lower left, you'll see what's termed a flow restrictor. And it's really designed to um, to basically slow the rush of water and release it slowly. Uh, but the important thing is just to make sure that it's clear of debris and, and maintained so that it can function properly. Uh, obviously, you want to retain water on your roof for a short period of time, but you don't want it to stay there. Otherwise, it can cause issues. Um, one of the cool things with this, this roof here is once it goes into those, uh, those drains, um, uh, about 60% of the facility uh, directs those drains uh, down into an underground uh, cistern, uh, a massive cistern, it's 250,000 liters. Um, and from what I understand, that, that, can, that can fill up uh, no problem. Uh, it, is, it is, like I said, a very large facility with a lot of impervious surface. Um, and then this is a shot, they actually take that water and they use it for uh, washing the transit buses. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's sort of a win-win situation where they can, they can actually uh, not only sort of uh, prevent sort of the, 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 the volume, the water quantity and water quality issues with that water, but also actually uses as a resource where they're where they're saving money by not having to use municipal water uh, at this facility. Um, so we thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so that, if you uh, manage to do everything in terms of water quantity issues, then you can get up to 25%. Quality controls uh, again, stormwater ponds are. Uh, these are some of the uh, more traditional engineered solutions. Stormwater ponds can, can provide some water quality uh, improvements. Uh, oil and grit separators are, are designed to uh, manage parking lots, and these are things that you probably wouldn't notice, but uh, if you see those sort of manhole covers uh, at the edge of a parking lot, uh, that's probably a good sign that it's an oil and grit separator, and those have to be maintained. Uh, paved sweeping plan. Uh, 
so this is something that's really encouraged and you can get credits for uh, in terms of just making sure if you have a parking lot or other impervious surfaces that you you clean up that grit so that it doesn't uh, get washed into the storm sewer system and clog things up essentially as well as cause pollution um, and again we get into a little more of the greener uh, sort of uh, more recent technologies uh, vegetated filter strips um, you might see these sometimes on the edge of roadways they're becoming more common uh, salt management plan um, and uh, bioswales or vegetated swales um, and so this is again we're back at the GRT Operations Center um, this is a photo of the bioswale so they manage their uh, parking lot water um, by basically directing it and you'll notice the curb cut and that's 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 kind of key is is having that curb cut at the low point of your parking lot um, and then having some form of pretreatment so that's what the function of those what those sort of stones are, are, are serving so that'll remove a lot of the the large solids and uh, larger pollutants before it gets into the bioswale uh, once it does uh, you know the bioswale is graded so that it'll go down and infiltrate as much as possible um, the whole idea is to make that uh, vegetated so that encourages um, microorganisms which can actually remove hydrocarbons and other pollutants uh, as well so that that's really where you get that bang for your buck in terms of water quality improvement um, and as you can see that sort of pipe on the on the right is uh, an inspection well where you can actually make sure that uh, the system is functioning and uh, maintained properly um, this is one uh, again I'd, ideally you you'd want to probably see a little more vegetation in something like this uh, the more the better really uh, um, and uh, the other thing I forgot to mention with rain gardens is the other sort of huge advantage you can get is by using uh, native plant species so um, it's not a requirement but if you do use sort of native plant species uh, they are tolerant of both wet uh, extreme wet and extreme dry conditions uh, as well as they have root systems that are uh, designed to go down because we do have drought periods in our climate of sort of long periods in the summer so the root systems are very deep and that allows the water to go back into the groundwater table um, smart about salt again this speaks to salt management particularly on you know parking lots and sidewalks uh, this is a program that was started up in the region of Waterloo and it's uh, it's uh, I believe it's province-wide now uh, but it's it's really designed to get contractors to use uh, smart more so uh, in, in sort of the most efficient way possible by uh, uh, you know sometimes you kind of have to because there are slip and falls issues and liability issues there's there's not a great way to get around using salt uh, especially in large applications uh, but using it smartly is is really sort of the mantra and there's different ways to do that by you know taking temperature of the of the, of the ground which is not necessarily the what you'll see in the forecast so you you can really uh, get way more bang for your buck if you use uh, uh, a smartest boat salt well a uh, trained contractor uh, and again I talked about the paved area sweeping plan which is is something you want to do at least kind of twice a year and build into your sort of maintenance uh, uh, facility management uh, requirements um, each of these can get you 5% credit so you can get, just by doing these things which are pretty easy to do you can get up to 10% uh, 10% back um, I'm just going to quickly show uh, a bit of a case study um, this is a property on Trillium Drive um, and you'll notice uh, they uh, manage their parking lot water 
Uh, you can kind of see in the green on the right is a stormwater pond. It's empty right now, but all of their uh, water from the parking lot, which is tends to be dirtier than rooftop water, uh, so it needs to have sort of a quality control measure put in place um, to actually get that credit. is is managed by that uh, by that uh, stormwater pond. <coughs> And then they also direct all of their water. Uh, you can't see it uh, from the sky, but uh, underground is an infiltration gallery. So all of their water from the rooftop uh, goes into the infiltration gallery, and any overflow goes into the stormwater pond. So they can get 25% credit for that. Um, so they can get up to 40% credit. Um, and just quick quiz, does anybody remember where they can get that extra 5%. Education, right. So uh, if they wanted to get that max out their full 5%, then they could go that, uh, get the full 45%. That's the one thing that they weren't doing, so they got a 40% credit. Uh, so again, uh, obviously we're self-promoting ourselves as, as one of the ways you can do that, uh, but um, but there, there are other ways you can do that, and, and if you go to our website, we'll, we'll uh, give you the details on how to do that. Um, if you're interested in kind of seeing hands-on how this technology works, um, we have a demonstration house on Mill Street at Queen. Um, it's basically across from the Schneider House, if anybody knows where that is. Um, and we, um, we have a lot of these technologies. We have rain gardens, infiltration galleries, uh, several different uh, rainwater harvesting uh, technologies, uh, gray water system, not mentioned here, uh, and permeable pavers as well. So if you do want to see this technology in action, then you can actually come by and see it. Um, once a month, we have a speaker series, which uh, we have presentations on not only stormwater, but energy efficiency as well. Uh, but we always couple that with an open house so you can you can get a chance to see Reap House as well and uh, get a tour of some of these technologies. And all of our guides uh, are, are well versed in them. So if you have questions, it's, it's a good opportunity. Um, and I'll just sort of mention that we just got our, I meant to put on the slide a little LEED Platinum logo, but that we're one of the first uh, uh, Houses. It's a hundred-year-old century home, but we've we've recently got our uh, lead sort of uh, platinum certification, uh, which isn't the first, but it's one of the first uh, kind of in the region to do that. Um, and I'll just put up this slide again. Um, the stormwater departments um, are more than happy to talk about their credits. If you have questions, uh, if you're more comfortable talking to us, you can do that as well. Uh, but they do have direct contacts as well, um, and they're all very friendly staff. Uh, so why are we doing it? This is my last slide. It's basically to leave a grand legacy uh, kind of into the future. Uh, you know, it's it's not only a right, it's a responsibility as well. So uh, yeah, and I guess we'd, we'd uh, open it up for, for questions at this point. I'm just curious about the Century Home LEED Certified Home. Where, where is that located? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, 20 Mill Street, um, which is right at the corner of uh, Mills, Mill and Queen Street. So kind of close to Victoria Park, um, across from the Schneider House. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the stuff you can, if, if you're not available for a tour, you can actually walk around and see on your own. And there are some signage which will help explain it as well. Right. Right. 
Yeah, they, they can function uh, year-round. They don't get taken offline in the winter or anything. Um, generally speaking, um, if you are you do have concerns, we haven't had problems, but you can sort of, uh, if you do want to make sure that there's not going to be problems in the winter, you just make sure you go kind of a few feet down below the frost line kind of thing, um, and you shouldn't run into any problems. In terms of uh, how they function in the spring, it would work equally well. The one sort of caveat I would put on that is like um, you have to kind of know where the water table is. So if you're in an area that is sort of uh, tends to rise in the spring where the whole water table rises, it's it's not going to infiltrate into the ground uh, if, if the water table is basically at the same level as the infiltration gallery. Um, there's uh, different ways to look at that. I mean, the Grand River Conservation Authority has sort of floodplain maps, uh, which are uh, not 100% updated. They're in the process of kind of looking at updating those. Uh, so that's that's one way you could kind of look at it. Um, but I mean, you, you should be able to tell if you have water in your basement or, or, or generally speaking, what the water table's like. I mean, the, the easiest way is just kind of dig down in the spring, and if you see water, then you know it's kind of saturated already. Yeah. What's the difference between a cistern and the um, rain barrel? Like, I, I, I don't know what a cistern is. Um, so, cistern, there's a lot of different flavors of them. Um, and again, this is not a new technology. A lot of sort of older homes um, will have these sort of built in, uh, built into them uh, for people who, who weren't obviously connected to uh, municipal infrastructure at the time and used it for all their water needs. Uh, this an ex on the left, you see that's an above ground cistern. And these are uh, some of the newer ones. I believe that's about 1,200 liters. Uh, but to answer your question is um, they basically serve the same exact same function as a rain barrel. They're just bigger, right? Um, the problem you run into with rain barrels, especially when you need to capture that much water, is just maintaining them, and especially when you have to connect them in series uh, and put them at multiple downspouts. Uh, it just sort of allows you to capture more water in a single place and uh, this one's actually hooked up to uh, a pump as well so if you want to get the water out and use it for irrigation purposes uh, their plan this is at St. John's Church uh, on Water Street uh, they're actually hoping to install uh, a cistern which will be used that they'll plumb inside and use for toilet flushing um, so there's a couple different examples of that around around town. Uh, so yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> mm -hmm. You mentioned gray water systems part, part way through. Are they still uh, legal in the sense that they used to be in the old days in terms of taking household gray water as well? Uh, yeah, gray water systems are part of the building code. Um, so up until uh, the most recent edition of the Ontario Building Code, they could only be used for, like the water uh, could be used for uh, flushing toilets. Um, so it's kind of restrictive in terms of how they can be used. They recently updated it so they can also be used for uh, laundry as well. Uh, but they can't be used for drinking water, for example. That's kind of against the code. Um, and there are sort of different regulations around installing a gray water system, uh, but I think that's kind of beyond the scope of uh, this presentation. <coughs> yes. Um, so just for the benefit of people on the webcast, uh, the question is uh, what quality control functions does stormwater, stormwater ponds serve? Um, I mean, the, the primary function 
of stormwater ponds is is a more of a quantity control. So it basically, uh, you know, captures that water and releases it slowly. That's what they're really designed to do. Um, if you, as I mentioned with the bioswale, if you sort of vegetate around that, um, then it can create sort of filter strips, which sort of encourage uh, microorganisms, which can serve some quality control functions as well. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. Right. Um, well, what we try and encourage people to do, um, it's not always practical or pragmatic. Uh, Generally speaking, if you have a rain barrel that's full, it's not going to serve a lot of function in terms of, of capturing that water and slowing it down. If you know that there's going to be a storm in the forecast, uh, you know, we'd encourage, we try and encourage people to empty it out so that it's ready to accept more water when that storm event does occur. Um, if you find that is that's uh, something that you're just not going to do or, or you find that you, it's kind of always full, then an infiltration gallery might be, um, you know, the way to go. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of these work well in tandem. So uh, uh, like in the previous example, where if you have a rain barrel, um, you can sort of have a rain barrel and sort of direct the overflow into an infiltration gal gallery so you don't have to worry about it overflowing and you still have that water and you don't have to sort of, it's there if you do want to use it for, for you know, watering your plants or whatever. Yes, that's a bit. Yeah. 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 If if you don't have the right soil conditions, you can sort of amend the soil. But if you're if you're dealing with uh, like very clay-like conditions, um, you can you could still install a rain garden, and especially if you put in native plants, that, those sort of root. Uh, root systems can help to sort of allow for some infiltration, but uh, generally speaking, it's not an ideal scenario for installing either infiltration galleries or rain gardens. Uh, that's, that's why you want to do that percolation test, because if you are running into heavy clay soils, uh, you don't want to uh, put in a rain garden that's going to become a swamp, right? Uh, and, in, you know, encourage mosquitoes and whatever else, right? So. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the, it, it's highly variable. I live, like I said, close to Victoria Park, and even on my own property, there's like, it's almost, you can dig down and find almost sand dunes, and sort of at the back of the property, there's, it's really kind of a clay sandy mix. Uh, so it's it's highly vari variable in, in all over Waterloo Region, but if you do have a clay uh, conditions, then yeah, you might be better at just looking at capturing that water using like a cistern or or something else and then trying to get the overflow away. Uh, infiltration might not be the best option for you. Yes? Right. Uh, yeah, actually, there was a there was a couple uh, based in Kitchener, and they had very clay-like soil. Every and they'd been dealing with this for ten years. Every time there was uh, a storm, they would have basically their backyard would fill up with water. And uh, there's some nasty pictures on our website. Um, but if you can use sort of a French drain system, which is basically 
uh, kind of like in the right, but they basically, and farmers do this, they use drainage drainage tiles to sort of spread that out. So you're, uh, and the, the, the tiles have are perforated, so they allow some infiltration to water to go out. So it, it spreads it out over a larger area and you do get um, more water that can infiltrate if you if you kind of do that, um, and especially if you direct kind of the end point is like a rain garden, for example. Uh, so there, if you kind of spread the water out using like a drainage tile or, or, or French drain, then that's that might be an option um, if if you're looking at uh, you know a lot of water ponding issues. <laughs> All right. Well, like, thanks very much. Thank oh, you very much welcome. for today's presentation. That was very informative. Thank you.